Today, Air France jets span the distance it took Marco Polo years to cover in a few short hours. Tomorrow, you can glide over the canals of Thailand, shaded by the exotic vegetation of a tropical world. Coconut palms, banana, and mango trees. The wooden houses of these villages are perched on stilts, and you can look in on the frugal outdoor life of the villagers performing their daily chores. To go to the temple, you take a boat. You also go to market in a boat. In this case, it's a floating market. Market is held every day from 7 to 8.30 in the morning, except on the sacred day reserved for the worship of Buddha. The wares are placed in the bow of the boats, and the housewives wind in and out, picking what they need from these floating shops. When a sale is made, the merchant wraps the purchase in banana leaves before handing it over to the customer. Bangkok, the floating city, is also the city of the gods because of its many temples. The towers of the temple of Aurora overlook the river which irrigate the city. But the most beautiful of the Thai sanctuaries is without doubt the marble temple. Two singas or stylized marble lions guard the entrance to the chapel. The door opens onto a colossal statue of a seated Buddha whose golden ornamentation glimmers in the semi-darkness. The rich can rent effigies of Gautama for their prayers. Notably, in the temple of the reclining Buddha, whose extensive ramifications include a university. On their way to class, the young Buddhist priests pass by a statue to the memory of Marco Polo or meditate on the futility of earthly life among the tombs of the kings. But the most famous of all the temples is close upon the royal palace. A wall encloses the numerous buildings grouped around the rectangular temple of the Emerald Buddha. After a last look at the monumental stone guardians whose purpose is to ward off the evil spirits from the sacred enclosure, a snack at the grill of the Oriental Hotel dominating the city will rest your weary limbs.
In the days of its greatest glory, before the living forest engulfed it, Angkor was an immense procession of cities covering more than 450 square miles. But Angkor for centuries lay forgotten, and the green carpet of the tropical jungle slowly hid it from view. The roots of giant trees slowly separated the rocks and dismembered the walls, tumbling huge statues and base reliefs to the ground. The French Far Eastern School took up the superhuman task of restoring this forgotten civilization to life. The graceful temple of Bante Sre had been reduced to a mass of dislodged stones. With unflagging patience and perseverance, archaeologist Henri Marchal applied the most recent methods of research and analysis. He painstakingly put together the giant puzzle, each stone section of which weighed several tons, and endeavored to reconstruct the original monument. And now, the visitor can once more admire the faultless proportions of this rediscovered jewel of Khmer art, with the delicate sculptures of its ornamental façade, retracing the story of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, and with its statues of Devata. But the Bhante Sre, with its curious red sandstone construction, can give but a very fragmentary notion of the grandiose creations of Khmer architecture. As you enter the huge enclosure of Angkor Thom through the victory door, the Bayon stands before you with its 50 ornamental towers, each carrying the four giant symbols of the omnipresence. Further along, the terrace of the elephants with its rows of heavily caparisoned mastodons evokes the splendors of the Khmer civilization. Then, the terrace of the Leper King, splendidly decorated and sculpted. It is topped by the statue of the cruel judge, who despite his name, was neither king nor a leper. Finally, the famous temple of Angkor Vat, built in the first half of the 12th century and completely surrounded by a moat. It forms a mile-long rectangle dominated by the central sanctuary, which towers close to 200 feet. The edifice has three superimposed galleries offering a splendid view over the dense forest. A marvelous example of Khmer architecture, but an essentially symbolic one, for the Khmer temples were not utilitarian edifices designed to house the faithful. They were the grandiose residences of the deities, built on sacred mountains. Today, the royal palace of Phnom Penh jealously and lovingly guards the cultural and artistic traditions of the Khmer civilization, which ruled over the major part of the Far East from the 9th to the 15th century.
Its ballet troupe perpetuates the marvelous sacred dances inspired by the Ramayana and the holy books. Hong Kong in Chinese means perfumed haven, and so great is the beauty of this island with the jagged coastline that even civilization has not succeeded in altering its splendor. A new ferry station has recently been completed. Every five minutes, ferry boats ply the waters from the mainland to the island. One takes the ferry boat here, just as one would take the subway in New York or the tube in London. The ferries carry more than 100 million passengers every year. Activity is at its peak during rush hours. As in the West, Chinese girls follow the fashion. Skirts slit high on one side are a must. These are the busy arteries of Hong Kong's business district, Central Devoe Road and Queens Road, grouping banks, offices, administrative headquarters for the major steamship and airlines. The city is served by buses and double-deck streetcars, but if you really want to visit Hong Kong, no improvement on the old-fashioned rickshaw has yet been found. First, we come upon the Chinese Quarter with its variety of multicolored signs. Then, on foot this time, we wander through the steep and tortuous streets where one of the world's most curious markets is held. This remarkable institution, open 24 hours a day, is rightly or wrongly known as the Thieves' Market. 
Here in the teeming hubbub of merchants, artisans, buyers, and coolies with their loads, you can buy just about anything, fruit, vegetables, the most prosaic wares, as well as the richest silks and brocades, lacquered duck, swallow's nests, and dried snakes, which are considered a great delicacy. Take a good look at the native city of Hong Kong. It belongs to a past which has all but disappeared. This is the last of the Chinese cities which has preserved intact its ancient appearance and customs, a faithful image of bygone days which the next few years will obliterate forever. But let us leave the thieves market and boarding our rickshaw again, go off to visit Tiger Bomb at the opposite end of the city. This extravagant house was built by a Chinaman who amassed a huge fortune by making and selling a medicinal product called Tiger's Balm. Fortunately, the majority of Hong Kong's houses are in better taste. There are many splendid residences, especially along the famous beach of Repulse Bay. The most elegant of hotels are also found here. You can lunch in the sun on the flowered terrace. And just a few miles away, it is also lunchtime, but in a completely different setting. This is Aberdeen one of the quaintest fishing villages of the island. More than 150,000 Chinese live on these sampans. They were born on these tiny boats. They grew up on them, married, and more than likely they will die on them without having set foot on terra firma more than perhaps a dozen times during their whole lifespan. The grocer, the butcher, the hardware man delivered by boat the few items families need for their frugal existence. Evening falls. One by one, lights appear on the junks and sampans. A last glimpse at the mysterious and fascinating China Sea before our jet whisks us back to our own world. But we know we shall return. China is now only a stone's throw from our home by Air France. <laughs>